Middlemarch. Oh, no. Dickens. Dickens, no. Ah, yes. Dickens. Good old Charlie. Genius. And guardian of the Johnny Walker. Here's you both. Mm. Oh. Julia. Julia. Well, yeah, obviously, I am still here. Well, I've got this, um, what's it called, Open University student this evening. Darling, yeah, I, I did mention it. Well, yes, yes, I probably shall go to the pub afterwards. I'll no doubt need to go to the pub afterwards, if only to swill away some silly woman's attempts to get into the minds of Pardy or Henry James or whoever the hell it is we're supposed to be studying on this bloody course. Christ, why did I ever agree to take this on? Y yes. Yes, darling. Y yes, I probably did take it on to help pay for the drink. Yeah, I promise. No cigarettes. I promise. Look, Julia, I have to go. There's someone at the door. Yeah. Yeah. I All right, I promise. Just a couple of quick pints and I'll be trotting back just as fast. Come in! Absolutely, darling. Nine at the very latest. Come in! My word. My solemn word, 9.30 at the absolute outside. I've got to go, I've got to. Bye, darling. Come in! Come in! I am coming in, aren't I? Uh, stupid bleeding handle on the door. You want to get it fixed? Uh, yes, I, uh, I, I suppose I always meant to. Well, what good is that always meaning to? You should get on with it because one of these days you'll be shouting come in and it'll go on forever and ever because the poor sod on the other side of the door won't be able to come in and you won't be able to get out. Uh, and you are... What am I? Pardon? What? You are... I'm a what? What's your name? Oh, my name. Oh, um, Rita. Uh, but it says here, Mrs S. White. Oh, that, yeah. That's, that's just S for Susan. That's my real name. I've changed it to Rita, though. I'm not a Susan anymore. I've called myself Rita, you know, after Rita Mae Brown. Uh, who? You know, Rita Mae Brown. Ruby Fruit Jungle. Uh, Rita Mae Brown, she wrote it. Look, Ruby Fruit Jungle. Uh, Have you never read Ruby Fruit Jungle? Uh, it's fantastic. Do you want to lend it? Pardon? Uh, no, Here, thank you. Take it. Go on. Oh, you'll love it. I'm telling you. Well, if you insist. Uh, c can I offer you a seat? No. It's brilliant, this room, isn't it? I is it? Do you get a lot like me? I beg your pardon? Do you get a lot of students like me? Uh, well, not exactly, no. I was dead surprised when they accepted me. It's different, isn't it, the open university? I suppose anyone can get in, can't they? Do you think they must be desperate? Oh, I wouldn't say that. Look, are you sure you wouldn't like to sit down? Yeah. Can I smoke? Uh, tobacco? Yeah. Uh, I think there's an ashtray. Um... Yeah, do you want one? Oh, I'd love one. Well, here, have one. No, no, really, I've, I've made a promise I've given up. Oh, everyone has. They're all afraid of getting cancer. They're all cowards. You've got to challenge death and disease. I read this great poem about fighting death. Ah, Dylan Thomas. No, Roger McGough. Uh, it's all about this old man who runs away from hospital and stands in the street shouting and challenging death to come out and fight. It's brilliant. Mind you, you probably won't think it's any good at all. Why not? Because it's the sort of poetry you can understand. <laughs> uh, uh, um, look, can I... Can I offer you a drink? What of? Scotch. You should be careful with that stuff. It kills your brain cells. But you'll have one. Yeah, all right. I haven't got any brain cells. No, no, no. Thinks, thinks. F, F, F. Faulkner, Fielding. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. E.M. Ah, good old E.M. <laughs> Why do you keep it behind the books? Um, well, it's a little arrangement I have with my immediate employers. It's called discretion. To drink is tolerable, not so to display the evidence. And so poor old Johnny Walker must discreetly bide his time behind sons and lovers, pride and prejudice, or in this case, Howard's End. Howard's End? Sounds filthy, doesn't it? Uh, uh, here. E.M. Foster. Forster. Forster to do what? <laughs> it's doubtful that he would have forced her to do anything. Edward Morgan Forster was a committed homosexual. So is that what the book's about? Mm, no, no, not really. Uh, it's, um, but here, look, borrow it, read it for yourself. Oh, OK. Thanks. I'll look after it. 
If I pack the course in, I'll post it back to you. Pack it in? You're not even started yet. Why should you pack it in? I don't know. I just might. Might decide it was a stupid idea. Well, why did you enrol in the first place? Because I want to know. W- what? What do you want to know? Everything. Everything? Well, that's rather a lot, isn't it? Where were you thinking of beginning? Well... I'll have to do exams and that, won't I? Well, yeah, eventually. So, I'll have to learn about it all, won't I? It's like, you sit there, don't you, watching something like ballet or plays or opera on the telly. And you just call it rubbish because that's what it looks like, because you don't understand, you don't know how to see it. So you just switch over or switch off and say, I'm not watching shite like that. Do you? Yeah. But I don't want to do that, because I want to be able to see it and understand... Do you mind me swearing? Not remotely. Do you swear? When appropriate, yeah, of course. I've never subscribed to the notion that there's such a thing as bad language, only bad use of language. See? The properly educated know it's only words, don't they? It's only the masses who don't understand. It's not their fault, they can't help it. Sometimes I hate them. They do me head in. God, what's it like to be free? (laughs) Now there's a question. Um, another drink? Nah. You don't mind if I... Uh... It's your whiskey. It's your room. Yeah. I love that window. It's massive, isn't it? Do you like it? Uh, the window? It's not really something to which I give a great deal of thought, apart from occasionally getting an urge to throw something through it. Like what? A student, usually. <laughs> <laughs> You're bleeding mad, you, aren't you? Aren't you supposed to be interviewing me? Do I need to? I know. I talk too much, don't I? It's when I'm nervous. What does assonance mean? (laughs) Don't laugh at me. No. I I said don't laugh at me. uh, uh, No, no, no. Um, I I, I didn't mean... um, uh, Assonance? Well, uh, it's, um, it's, it's it's a form of rhyme in which the corresponding vowels have the same sound, but not the consonants that precede or follow the vowels. And uh, and it can can be confusing because assonance can also be the use of identical consonants, but with different vowels. Um, Killed, cold. Draft, drift. Pin, pan. Gloom, gleam. Drink, drank. Wink, wank. (laughs) Oh, God! (laughs) No, no. That's uh, that's right. Wink. Um, yeah, you're right. Look, look. Do you know Yeats? The wine lodge. The poet W. B. Yeats, Irish poet. Look, is look. You see, um, yeah, the wild swans are cool. And here, you see, see how he's using really subtle assonance, rhyming the word swan with the word stone. So. So, assonance sort of means getting the rhyme wrong. Well, yeah. Yeah, in a a way, it does. But intentionally, purposefully, in order to achieve a certain lyrical, subtle, almost musical effect. Oh. See? There's loads I don't know. Um, It says here you're a lady's hairdresser. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a, are you a good ladies' hairdresser? When I want to be. Most of the time I don't, though. They get on my nerves. Who? My customers. Ah. Uh. They walk in the salon and they want to walk out an hour later as a different person. I tell them I'm a hairdresser, not a magician, not a plastic surgeon. See, most of them, that's why they come, the hairdressers, because they want to be changed. But if you want to change, you have to do it from the inside, don't you? You know, like I'm doing. Trying to do. Do you think I'll be able to do it? Uh, well, that really depends on you. On how committed you are. I'm dead serious. Look, I know I take the piss on that, but that's only because I'm not, you know, confident. But I want to be. I want to know. Everything. <laughs> what are you looking at me like that for? Because I think you're really rather marvellous. Oh, shut up. You're the first breath of fresh air that's been in this room for years. Oh, 
Don't you recognise a compliment? Oh, sod off. Oh, well, I'm, I, I may very well sod off, but before I do, Rita, are you going to tell me what it is that suddenly led you to coming somewhere like that? Oh, it's not sudden. I've been realising for ages that it was slightly out of step. I'm 26. Should have had a baby by now. Everyone expects it. I'm sure my husband thinks I'm sterile. He was moaning all the time. Come off the pill, let's have a baby. I told him I had come off it just to shut him up. But I'm still on it. See, I don't want a baby yet. I want to find myself first. Discover myself. Do you understand that? Um, I, th I think so. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't round our way, though. I've tried to explain it to my husband, but between you and me, I think he's thick. No, not thick. Blind. That's what he is. He can't see because he doesn't want to see. If I try and do anything different, he gets a gob on him. Even if I'm just reading or watching something different on the telly, he gets really knocked. I used to just tell him to piss off, but then I realised it was no good doing that, and what I should do is try and explain to him. Only when I do, when I try and explain how I want a better way of living my life, he just says it'll be all right when we have a baby. You sure I can't offer you another drink? When do you actually, you know, start teaching me? What can I possibly teach you? Everything. Everything. I'll make a bargain with you, yes? I'll teach you everything I know, but if I do that, then you must promise never to come back here. My dear, it's, it's not your fault. It's just the luck of the draw that you got me. But get me, you did. And, and the thing is, between you and me and the walls, I'm really rather an appalling teacher. Most of the time, that doesn't really matter. Appalling teaching is perfectly in order for most of my equally appalling students. But you, young woman, you're quite, quite different. And you're seeking a very great deal indeed. And I'm afraid I can't provide it. Everything I know, and you must listen to this, is that I know absolutely nothing. Added to which I can't abide the hours of this open university malarkey, intolerably bloody unsocial. They expect you to teach when the pubs are open. And when the sun is over the yard arm, my dear, that's really where I should be. I can be a rather good teacher when I'm in the pub. Four pints a week Guinness, and I can be as witty, as wild, as pity, as swift, as illuminating as well. I'm sorry, but there are other tutors, and I'm sure, you know, I'll make all the necessary arrangements, and the college will be in touch, and uh, goodbye. For God's sake! Let me back in. Oh, Go away! Oh, wait a minute. Open, open the door. Listen. Leave me alone. There are other tutors, I've told you. I... You're my tutor. I don't want another tutor. For God's sake, woman, I've told you. You are my tutor. But I've told you. I don't want to teach you. I can't teach you. Why come to me? Because you're a crazy mad piss artist who wants to throw his students through the window. And I like you. Don't you recognise a compliment? And when I come back next week, I'm going to bring me scissors and give you a haircut. You are not coming back next week. I am. And you're getting your haircut. Oh, I don't think so. So you want to walk around like that, do you? What? Like what? Like a geriatric hippie. Ta-ra. When he left the army, he went to the English section of the China Music. Yes. He has a translator, broadcasting what we in the West call propaganda. Yes. What the Life hell? was easier, perhaps. Oh. I was just oiling the door handle. Got you some WD-40. Well, I knew you'd never get down to it. Here, yeah, you can have that. Oh, uh, thank you. Don't you ever just walk into a room and sit down? I'm going to have a room like this one day. Well, you don't care about the curtains and you don't have to have a three-piece suite. Are you all right? Why shouldn't I be? You just look different. Do I? Yeah. You've not been drinking, have you? Uh, well, since you asked, no, as a matter of fact. Is that because of me? Because of what I said to you? Yeah. What? You think where so many others have failed, you have reformed me, Rita. I don't want to reform you. You can do what you like. I love that lawn down there. It looks the way I always imagine somewhere like Eton or Harrow to look. 
When I was a kid, I always wanted to go to boarding school. God forbid, whatever for? I always thought they sounded great, girls like that. You know, with a, a tuck shop and matron, and there was always a pair of kids called Jones Major and Jones Minor. <laughs> I always loved that. What sort of school did you go to? A dump. Well, no one cared about school anyway. Studying was just for the wimps, wasn't it? If I'd taken school seriously, I would have had to become different from your mates, and that's not allowed. By whom? By your mates, your family, by everyone. What you've really got to be into is music and clothes and getting a fella. Not that I showed any reluctance. I mean, there was always something in my head tapping away, trying to tell me I might have got it all wrong. But I'd just play another record or buy another dress and stop worrying. There's always another club to go to, a new fella to be chasing, a laugh and a joke with the girls. And then one day, you just stop and look and say, is this it? Is this all that I can expect from this living lark? And that's the really big moment, that is. That's when you've got to decide whether it's going to be another change of dress or a change in yourself. And it's really tempting to go out and get another dress, you know, because it doesn't really cost anything. It doesn't upset anyone around you. It doesn't hurt those who don't want you to change. But you did it. You managed to resist another new dress. Can't you tell? Look at the state of this. <laughs> I haven't had a new dress in 12 months. <laughs> and I'm not going to get one either. Not till I pass my first exam. And then I'll get a proper dress. The sort of dress you'd only see on an educated woman. On the, the sort of woman who knows the difference between Jane Austen and... and... Ethel Austen. Come on, let's start. Oh, all right. Uh, now, look, this piece you wrote for me... On, what was it called? Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. Yeah, well, the thing is, um, it was... Uh, how can I say it? Garbage. No, no, no. The thing is, it was an appreciation and not criticism. I didn't want to criticise Ruby Fruit Jungle, because I think it's brilliant. No, no, when I say criticism, I don't necessarily mean being critical in a censorious way. I'm talking about analytical criticism. Oh, and what's the difference? Well, you should approach criticism as being purely objective. You see, you might consider Ruby Fruit Jungle to be what you call brilliant, mm. but that is mere opinion. It's subjective. And in criticism, there is no place for the subjective, for the sentimental, for the partial or partisan. Mm. Literary criticism should be detached and thoroughly supported by reference to established literary critique. Now... Bearing all of that in mind, I'd like you to give me a considered response to your reading of Howard's End. What, now? Yeah. You have read it. Yeah, I've read it. So? Howard's End? <clears throat> Howard's End, by the novelist E. M. Foster, uh, uh, Forster... Good, good. ...is 100% crap. What? In fact, it's even crapper than crap. Oh, really? And who the hell are you citing in support of that particular thesis? Trilling, Furbank, Leavis? No, me. What have I just said? Me is subjective. Well, it's what I think. You think one of the most considered novels of the 20th century is crap. Well, perhaps you'll do me the courtesy of explaining why you think it's, quote, crap, unquote. Yeah, all right, yeah, I will tell you. It's crap because the fellow who wrote it was a louse. Because halfway through that book, I could hardly go on reading it because he, Mr E.M. Bleed and Forster, says, quote, we are not concerned with the poor, unquote. That's why it's crap. That's why I could hardly keep on reading it. That's why. Because he said we are not concerned with the poor. Yeah, that's right. But he wasn't writing about the poor. When he wrote that book, the conditions of the poor in this country were appalling and he's saying he couldn't care less, Mr E.M. Sodden Foster. Foster. I don't care what he was called, sitting up there in his ivory tower and saying he couldn't care less. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. <laughs> well, this is madness. You can't interpret E.M. Forster from a Marxist perspective. Why not? Look, before discussing any of this, I said no subjectivity, no sentimentality. I wasn't being sentimental. Of course you were. You wanted Forster to concern himself with the poor. Literature can ignore the poor. Well, I think that's immoral. Amoral. Have you any idea what kind of mark you'd get if you approached Forster in this way during an examination? No. Well, you might manage one or two percent if the examiner happened to be sympathetic to the one dubious quality your criticism does have. What's that? Brevity. All right, all right. But I hated that book. Can't we do something else? Can't we do a book that I like? But books that you like and books that will form the basis of your examination are extremely unlikely to be one and the same. The examiners, God help them, may never have heard of 
ruby fruit jungle. And that's why you're going to have to learn how to discipline that mind of yours. Learn how to focus and... Are you to... married? Oh, for God's sake. Oh, yeah. What's your wife called? Is my wife of the remotest relevance? Well, you should know. You marry there. All right. No, she's not relevant. We parted a long, long time ago. Satisfied? Sorry. Sorry for what? Sorry your wife left you. She didn't leave me. We split up. Now, look, the thing about Forster and a book like Howard's... Why and... did you split up? Perhaps you'd like to take notes. Then when you have to answer a question on Forster, you can treat the examiners to a dissertation on Frank's marriage. <laughs> oh, go away. It's only because I'm interested. My wife and I split up, Rita, because of poetry. Oh, behave. One sudden day, my wife pointed out that during the preceding 15 years, my output as a poet had dealt exclusively with that brief period in which we had discovered each other. You're a poet. Was. An extremely minor one. And so to give me something fresh to fire the muse, she left me. A very selfless and noble woman, my ex-wife. She sacrificed a marriage for the sake of literature. And what happened then? Oh, it did the trick. My conjugal loss was literature's gain. You started writing new stuff? No, I stopped writing altogether. Are you taking the piss? Well, people don't split up because of things like that, because of poetry and literature. Don't they? Well, nobody I know. Do you write any famous poems? No. <laughs> no. I published a couple of small collections, sold a few here and there. Can you still get them? I'll buy one of your books. All long out of print, I'm afraid. And you just live on your own now? No, no. I live with someone, Julia, an ex-student. She's now a tutor here. She's very caring, admires me enormously, and fortunately for me is extremely tolerant. Tolerant of what? Well, on occasion I have been known to stop out a little longer than intended. How long? Two, perhaps three... Hours? Days. Why? Now, look, that's enough of that. Let's... If you were mine and you stopped out for days, you wouldn't get back in. Uh -huh. But, Rita, if I was yours, would I even consider stopping out for days? Don't you like her, Julia? I like her enormously. It's myself that I'm not too fond of. But you're great. Uh -huh. A vote of confidence. Thank you, Rita. But I'm afraid that, ultimately, you'll find there's rather less to me than meets the eye. <sighs> See, you can say dead clever things like that. I wish I could just talk like that. It's brilliant. Yeah, all right. Now, come on. Howard's end. Oh, hey, leave that. I like just talking to you. But, Rita, you came here because you want an education. If it was up to me, then I'd happily sit and talk of nothing. In fact, if the choice was mine, I'd like to take you by the hand and run out of this room forever. Oh, be serious. I am, Rita, I am. Right now, there are a thousand things I'd rather do than teach. <laughs> Most of them with you, young woman. Oh, quick. <laughs> You just like saying things like that. Do I? You know you do. Oh, Rita. Why didn't you walk in here 20 years ago? Because I don't think they would have accepted me at the age of six. You know what I mean. I know. But it's not 20 years ago, Frank. It's now. You're there and I'm here. Yes, and you're here for an education. So come on, Forster. Oh, forget him. Now, you listen to me. You want to learn. You want me to teach you. Well, that, I'm afraid, means a lot of work for you as well as for me. You've barely had a basic schooling. You've never even sat a formal examination, let alone passed one. Possessing a hungry mind is not in itself a guarantee of any kind of success. All right, but I just don't like how it's bleeding in. Then go back to what you do like and stop wasting my time. You go off and buy yourself a new dress and I'll gladly go to the pub. Is that you putting your foot down? <laughs> it is, actually. Aren't you impressive when you're angry? Forster. <gasps> all right, all right. Uh, does the author's repeated use of the phrase only connect suggest that E.M. Forster was really a closet electrician? I can't do it. I've tried. All week I've tried. But I just can't understand what he's on about. Only connect. Only connect. It's no good. I just don't get it. You will. You will. Oh, it's all right for you to keep saying that. You know what it's about. I can't make head nor bloody tail of it, though, because... Do you think we could just forget about Forster for a moment? Oh, with pleasure. I want to talk to you about this that you sent me. That? Yes. Oh. In response to the question, suggest how you might resolve the staging difficulties inherent in a production of Ibsen's Pierre Gint, you have written, quote, do it on the radio, unquote. Precisely. Precisely what? Precisely do it on the radio. And that is the entire essay. Well... We were... we were just dead busy in the shop this week. You write your essays at work? Why? 
Denny gets really knocked if I work at home. He doesn't like me doing this course. I can't be bothered arguing with him. But you can't produce work as thin as this. Well, that's bleeding stupid because you say, don't you, that one line of exquisite poetry uh. says... Infinitely more than thousands of pages of secondary prose. Yeah, but you're not writing poetry. You are supposed to be writing an essay, and what I'm trying to make you understand is that whoever was marking this would want more than do it on the radio. Look, answering examination questions is a sort of ritual, a game with rules, and you have to observe those rules. Poets can ignore those rules. Poets can break every rule in the book. Poets are not trying to pass examinations, but, Rita, you are. When I was an undergraduate... There was a chap taking his final theology examination. He sat down in the hall, opened the exam paper, took out his pen and wrote, God knows all the answers. Whereupon, he handed in his paper and left. Did he? Yes, he did. And when it was time to collect his results, he was handed a piece of paper bearing the words, and God also awards the marks. <laughs> Did he fail? Of course he failed, and rightly so, because a clever answer is not necessarily the best answer. Oh, I wasn't trying to be clever. I was just run off my feet all this week, so I never had any all time. All right, yeah, yeah, I know, but you, you have got some time now, and I want you to give it just a quarter of an hour or so, adding some considered argument to this. <laughs> in attempting to resolve the staging difficulties in Pier Gint, I would present it on the radio because... And then outline your reasons, supporting them wherever possible with quotes from accepted authorities, all right? Yeah, all right. All right. Are you sure you understand? What do you think I am? Thick? <sighs> Frank, you know, mm. Pierre Gint. He was searching for the meaning of life, wasn't he? Uh, put at its briefest, yes. Yeah. I was doing this woman's hair on Wednesday. Rita. I'm going to do this, don't worry, I'll do it. But I just want to tell you, I was doing it here and I was dead bored of what the others were talking about in the shop. So I said to my customer, do you know about Pia Gint? She just thought it was some kind of new perm lotion. So I told her all about it, the play. And you know something? She was dead interested. Was she? Yeah. She says, I wish I could go off searching for the meaning of life. There's loads of them round by us who feel like that. Because there is no meaning. Really? Frank, you know culture? You know the word culture? Well, it doesn't just mean going the opera and the ballet and all that, does it? Uh, no. It means a way of living, doesn't it? Well, we've got no culture. Of course you have. What? Hmm. Do you mean like that working class culture thing? It, it, well, yeah. Yeah. I've read about that. I've never seen it, though. Well, then look around you. I do. But I don't see any culture. I just see everyone pissed or on the valley I'm trying to get from one day to the next. You don't say that round our way, like, because they're proud. And they'll say they have got culture as they sit there in the pub drinking keg beer out of plastic glasses and listening to shitty singers. Rita, if that's what people want, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But they don't want that, not just that. Because there's no meaning... They tell you stories about the past, about what it was like after the war and they had to fight for food and clothing and housing and health. And their eyes light up when they tell you about that because even though they had nothing, there was some meaning. But the thing is that now, now that most of them have got some sort of house and there's food and money around, they know that they're better off, but they know that they've lost something as well. There's like this sort of disease, but no one mentions it. Everyone behaves as though it's normal, you know, inevitable that there's vandalism and violence and, and houses burnt out and wrecked by the people they were built for. And all the papers do, and the unions and the telly, is tell people to go out and try and get more money. But they don't just want more money. It's like me, isn't it? You know, buying new dresses all the time, isn't it? And the unions telling people to go out and get more money, and then the papers and the telly telling them what to spend it on. So it's always kept covered up, this disease... Why didn't you take a course in politics? Oh, go away. I hate politics. I'm just telling you about round our way. I want to be on this course. You know, what I learn from you about art and literature, it feeds me inside. I can get through the rest of the week if I know I've got coming here to look forward to. Then he tried to stop me coming tonight. Tried to get me to go to the pub with him and his mates. He hates me coming here. It's like drug addicts, isn't it? Addicts hate it when one of them tries to break free. It makes me stronger coming here. That's what Denny's frightened of. Only connect. 
Oh, not being forced again. Only connect. You see what you've been doing? Just telling you to bolt home. Yeah, and connecting. Your dresses, society at large, consumerism, drugs and addiction, you and your husband. Connecting, make, making connections. How? You see? And, and in the book, in How It Ends, no one does connect. Exactly. Irony. Is that it? Is that all it means? Not all of it, but yeah, that's the nub of it. Why didn't you just explain that to me right from the start? Because you'll have a much better understanding of something if you discover it in your own terms. Aren't you clever? <laughs> Brilliant. Now, come on, peer again. What? I've done it. You've done it? In attempting to resolve the staging difficulties in a production of Ibsen's Peer Gint, I would present it as a radio play because, as Ibsen himself said, he wrote the play as a play for voices, never intending it to go on in a theatre. So if they had the radio in his day, that's where they would have... What's wrong? Rita, this is getting to be a bit wearisome. When you come to this room, you'll do anything except start work immediately. Couldn't you just come in prepared to work? Where's your essay? I haven't got it. You haven't done it? I said I haven't got it. You've lost it. Rita. It's burnt. B burnt? So were all the Chekhov books you lent me. Then he found out I was still on the pill. It's my own fault. I left me prescription out. He burns all my books. Oh, Christ. I'm sorry. I'll pay for the books. I'll buy you some more. Sod the books. I wasn't referring to the bloody books. Why can't he just let me get on with me learning? You think I was having a bleeding affair the way he behaves? And aren't you? No. What time have I got for an affair? I'm busy enough finding myself, let alone finding someone else. I don't want anyone else. I've begun to find me. Perhaps. Perhaps your husband... Thinks you're having an affair with me. Oh, Quay. You're just my teacher. I've told him. You've told him about me? What? I've... I've tried to explain to him how you give me room to breathe. You just, like, feed me without expecting anything in return. What did he say to that? He didn't. I was out for a while. When I came back, he'd burnt me books and papers, most of them. I said to him, you stupid get, even if I was having an affair, there's no point burning me books, is there? I'm not having it off with Anton Chekhov. He said I wouldn't put it past you to check up with a foreigner. What are you going to do? I'll order some new copies for you and I'll do the essay again. I mean about your husband. I see him looking at me sometimes and I know what he's thinking. He's wondering where the girl he married has gone to. He even brings me presents sometimes, hoping that the presents might make her come back. But she can't because she's gone and I've taken her place. Do you want to abandon this course? No. No? When art and literature begin to take the place of life itself, perhaps it's time no, to... But it's not taking the place of life, it's providing me with life. He wants to take life away from me. Coming here, doing this, it's given me more life than I've had in years. I told him I'd only have a baby when I had a choice. But he doesn't understand. He thinks we've got choice because we can go into a pub that sells eight different kinds of lager. He thinks we've got choice already. Choice between Everton and Liverpool, choosing which washing pounds, or choosing between one lousy school and the next, between a lousy job or the doll, choosing between stork and buzz oh, Yeah, well, perhaps your husband... No, I don't come here to talk about him. Why was Chekhov a comic genius? Rita, don't you think that tonight we could give the class a miss? No, I want to know. I've got to do this. He can bear me books and me papers, but if it's all here in me head, he can't touch it. It's like that with you, isn't it? You've got it all inside. Let's leave it for tonight. Let's go to the pub and drink pots of Guinness and talk. I've got to do this, Frank. I've got to. I want to talk about Chekhov. You don't think you should be talking about you and your husband? I don't want to. All right. All right. OK. Um...
Chekhov. <clears throat> C for Chekhov. C for compromise. Uh, we'll talk about Chekhov and we'll pretend this is the pub. When you were a power Frank, did you drink then? Uh, some. Not as much as now. So why do you drink so much now? <sighs> the great thing about booze, Rita, is that one is never bored when drinking, or boring, for that matter. Booze has this marvellous capacity for making one believe that underneath all the talk, one is actually saying something. Why did you stop being a poet? That is a pub question. Well, I thought we were pretending this was the pub. In which we discuss Chekhov. Well, he's second on the bill. You're first. Go on. Why did you stop being a poet? <laughs> I didn't stop, Rita, so much as realise I never was. I'd simply got it wrong. Instead of creating poetry, I spent, oh, years trying to create literature. Well, I thought that's what poets did. No, no, no. Poets should concern themselves only with poetry and do their very damnedest not to believe in literature. I don't understand that. You will, Rita. One day you will. <sighs> Sometimes I wonder if I'll ever understand any of it. It's like starting all over again, you know, with a different language. Like, I read that Chekhov play and I thought it was dead sad. It was tragic. People committing suicide and that Constantine kid's trying to produce his masterpiece while they're all laughing at him. It is. It's tragic. But then I read the blurb about it and everyone's going on about Chekhov being this comic genius. Yeah, but they don't mean comedy like... Uh, well, it's not jokes, gags, it's not stand-up comedy. Have you ever seen Chekhov in the theatre? No. Does he go? <sighs> Have you ever been to the theatre? No. You should. You should go. Hey, why don't we go tonight? Me? Go to the theatre? God, no. I detest the theatre. Well, why the hell are you trying to get me to go? Because you want to know. Will you come with me? Oh, certainly. And how would I explain that to Julia? Just tell her you come to the theatre with me. Julia, I should not be in for dinner tonight as I'm going to the theatre with Ravishing Rita. Would she mind? If she knew I was at the theatre with an irresistible thing like you. Well, she'd really be upset. Rita, as ludicrous as it may seem to you, even a woman who possesses a PhD is not above common jealousy. Well, what's she got to be jealous of me for? I'm not going to try and seduce her in the middle of the seagull. Oh, what an awful pity. You might have begun to make theatre exciting for me again. <laughs> Come on, Frank, come with me. You never tell the truth, you do, yeah? You'd always evade it, don't you, with jokes and that. Come on, come to the theatre with me, we'll have a laugh. Will we? Yeah, come on, we'll ring Julia. We will not ring Julia. Anyway, Julia's out tonight. So what will you do? Spend the entire night in the pub? Uh, yeah. Come with me, Frank. You'll have a better time than you will in the pub. Well, what is it you want to see? The importance of being... thingy. The importance it's not on at the moment. It is. I passed the church hall on the bus and there was a poster advertising. An amateur production? What? You're suggesting I forgo a night in the pub in order to watch The Importance crucified by a bunch of bloody amateurs in a church hall? Oh, it doesn't matter who's doing it. It's the same play, isn't it? I wouldn't be so sure of that, Rita. Oh, come on. Get your coat on. Oh. Here. Oh, God. I'm dead excited. I've never seen a live play before. And there's absolutely no guarantee you'll see a live play tonight. Why? Just because they're amateurs. You've got to give them a chance, Frank. They have to learn somewhere. And anyway, for all you know, they might be dead good. Or just dead. Oh, you're an awful snob, aren't you? Am I? All right, then, come on. Have you seen it before? Of course I have. Well, don't you go telling me what happens, will you? Don't go spoiling it for me. It would say that some of the ministers in Mrs. Thatcher's cabinet are not... Frank, Frank... What are you doing here? It's Thursday, you don't I, I know I shouldn't be here, it's my dinner hour, but listen, I've got to tell someone. Can you spare a minute? What the hell is it? I had to come and tell you. Frank, last night I went to the theatre. A proper one, a professional theatre. Oh, for God's sake, you had me worried. I thought it was something serious. It was, it was Shakespeare. I thought it was going to be really boring, but Frank, it wasn't. It was brilliant. Out, out, brief candle. I went out and bought the book. I'm going to write you an essay on it. Wasn't Macbeth's wife a coway? And that fantastic bit where he meets Macduff and he thinks he's all invincible. I was on the edge of my seat at that bit. I wanted to shout out and tell Macbeth, warn him. Oh, it was brilliant. It was like a thriller. <laughs> well, I'm delighted. Macbeth's a tragedy, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just... I just had to tell someone who'd understand. <laughs> well, I'm honoured that you chose me. 
Well, I better get back. Yeah. I've left the customer under the dryer. If I don't get a move on, there'll be another tragedy. Well, no, there, there won't be a tragedy. Oh, there will, you know. This woman's got dead brittle hair. If she's too long under the dryer, she'll come out bald. Which might be quite tragic, but it won't be a tragedy. What? Well, uh, look, the tragedy of the drama has nothing to do with the sort of tragic event you're talking about. Macbeth is flawed by his ambition, yes? Yeah, go on. And it's that f flaw which forces him to take the inevitable steps towards his own doom, you see? Whereas, Rita, a woman's hair being ruined or the sort of thing you read in the paper that's reported as being tragic, man killed by a falling tree, that's not a tragedy. Well, it is for the poor sod under the tree. <laughs> yeah, it's tragic, absolutely tragic, but it's, it's not a tragedy in the way that Macbeth is a tragedy. You see, in dramatic terms, tragedy is something that is inevitable, preordained almost. Even without ever having heard the story of Macbeth, you wanted to shout out to warn him and prevent him from going on, didn't you? Mm. Indeed, he's warned in the play, constantly. But he can't go back, he still treads the path to doom. But you see, the poor old fellow under the tree hasn't arrived there by following any inevitable steps, has he? No. There's no particular flaw in his character that has dictated his end. If he'd been warned of the consequences of standing beneath that particular tree, he wouldn't have done it, would he? You see? So... So Macbeth brings it on himself? Yes, yes. He goes blindly on and on, and with every step he's spinning one more piece of thread which will eventually make up the network of his own tragedy. Do you understand? I think so. Oh, I'm not used to thinking like this. I just seen it as a dead exciting story. But the way you tell it, you make, you make me see all sorts of other things as well. It's fun, isn't it? Tragedy. <laughs> yeah. All them students down on the lawn. They know all about this sort of thing, don't they? Look, what are you doing for lunch? Lunch? Oh, Christ, me customer! Well, if we don't get a move on, she'll be bald as a boiled egg. Oh, hey, Frank, listen. I was thinking of going to the art gallery tomorrow. It's my half day off. Um, do you want to come with me? All right. Oh, and look, what are you doing on Saturday? Away. Well, when you finish work. I don't know. I want you to come over to the house. Why? Well, well Julia's organised a few people to come round for dinner. And you want me to come? Yeah. Why? Well, why do you think? I don't know. Because you might enjoy it. Oh. Will you come? Uh, if you want. Well, what do you want? All right, I'll come. Yeah, and bring Denny. Oh, I don't know if he'll come. Well, ask him. All right. What's wrong? Watch all away. Now, I don't mind. A couple of empty seats at the dinner table means more of the vino for me, but Julia likes order. If we're having eight people to dinner, she expects to see eight. I'm not saying that I needed any sort of apology. You failed to turn up, that's up to you. But, I did uh, apologise. The word sorry scribbled on the back of your essay and thrust through the letterbox. Rita, that's hardly an apology. What does the word sorry mean if it's not an apology? When I told Denny we were going to yours, he went mad. We had a big fight about it. I told him if he wasn't going to go, I'd go on my own. And I tried to. All day Saturday, all day in the shop, I was thinking what to wear. Got home, tried on all kinds of dresses. Everything looked really awful. And all the time I'm trying to think of things I can say, what I can talk about. And I can't remember anything. It's all jumbled up in my head. I can't remember if it's Wild who's witty and sure he was shavy and all. Who the hell wrote Howard's End? Oh, Christ. Then I got the wrong bus to your house. Took me ages to find it. When I walked up your drive, I saw you all through the window, all talking and laughing, sipping your drinks, and I couldn't come in. Of course you could. I couldn't. I bought the wrong sort of wine. When I was in the off-licence, I knew I was buying the wrong sort. But I didn't know which was the right wine. For Christ's sake, I wanted you to come along. You weren't expected to dress up, to buy wine. If you go out to dinner, don't you dress up? Don't you take wine? Yeah, but it's well, not... Well, what? Well, you wouldn't take sweet sparkling wine, would you? But does it matter what I do? It wouldn't have mattered if you'd walked in with a bottle of Spanish plonk. It was Spanish. Well, why couldn't you just relax? It wasn't a fancy dress party. Don't you realise how people would have seen you if you'd just, just breezed in as yourself? They would have seen someone who's funny, delightful, charming. But I don't want to be delightful, charming, funny. What's funny? I don't want to be funny. 
I want to talk seriously with the rest of you. I don't want to spend the night coming on with the funnies because that's the only way I can get into the conversation. I didn't want to come to your house just to play the court jester. You weren't being asked to play that role. I just wanted you to be yourself. But I don't want to be myself. Me. Uh, what me? Some stupid woman who gives us all a laugh because she thinks she can learn because she thinks that one day she'll be like the rest of them, talking seriously, confidently, with knowledge, living a civilised life. Well, she can't be like that really, but bring her in because she's good for the laugh. If you believe that's why you were invited to be laughed at, then you can get out of here right now. You were invited because I wish to have your company, and if you can't believe that, then I suggest you stop visiting me and start visiting an analyst who can cope with issues such as paranoia. I'm all right with you here in this room, but when I saw those people you were with, I couldn't come in. I would have seized up because I'm a freak. I can't talk to the people I live with anymore, and I can't talk to the likes of them on Saturday or, or them out there because I can't learn the language. I'm an alien. I went back to the pub where Denny was and my mother and our Sandra and her mates. I decided I wasn't coming here again. I went into the pub and they were singing, all of them singing, some song they'd learned from the jukebox. And I stood in that pub and thought, just what in the name of Christ am I trying to do? Why don't I just pack it in, stay with them and join in with the singing? And why don't you? You think I can, don't you? Just because you pass a pub doorway and you hear the singing, you think we're all okay. That we're all surviving with the spirit intact. Well, I did join in with the singing. I didn't ask any questions, I just went along with it. But when I looked around, my mother had stopped singing and she was crying. Everyone just said she was pissed and we should get her home. So we did. And on the way, I asked her why. I said, why are you crying, mother? She said, because, because we could sing better songs than those. Ten minutes later, Denny had her laughing and singing again, pretending she hadn't said it, but she had. And that's why I came back. And that's why I'm staying. Uh, one second. Uh, what's that? Uh, me, me case. Me things. Rita? I'm going to be mother's. Uh, I got home from where he packed me bag. He said either I stop coming here and come off the pill, or I could get out altogether. Oh, Christ. It was an ultimatum. I explained to him didn't get angry or anything, I just explained to him how I had to do this. But he said it's warped me. He said I'd betrayed him. I suppose I have. How have you betrayed anyone? I have. I know he's right. But I couldn't betray myself. He says there's a time for education and it's not when you're 26 and married. Rita. I phoned my mother, she says I could go there for a week. And then I'll get a flat. <laughs> Sorry, it's just... Oh, come here. Come on, come on. Look, look, look. It's all right. I'll be, I'll be OK. Just... Just give me a minute. Oh, what was me Macbeth I say like? Oh, sod Macbeth. Why? Rita. No, come on, come on. I want you to tell me what you thought about it. Rita, in the circumstances, I really don't It doesn't think... matter, it doesn't matter, it doesn't. In the circumstances, I need to go on to talk about it and do it. What was it like? Oh, I told you it was no good. Is it really useless? Uh, I really don't know what to say. Well, try and think of something. <sighs> go on, I don't mind if you tell me it was rubbish. I don't want pity, Frank. Was it rubbish? No, 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 not rubbish. It's a, it's a totally honest, passionate account of your reaction to a play. It's, it's, a, it's an unashamedly emotional statement about a particular experience. Sentimental. No, no, it's far too honest for that. It's, it's almost um, moving. But in, in terms of what you're asking me to teach you of passing exams... Oh, God, you see, I, I don't... I oh, don't... say it! Go on, say it! In those terms, it's worthless. It shouldn't be, but it is. In its own terms, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's worthless, you said. And if it's worthless, you've got to tell me because I want to write essays like any other student. I want to know and pass exams like they but do. If, if you're going to write this sort of stuff, you're going to have to change. All right, well, tell me how to do it. But I don't know if I want to tell you, Rita. I don't know that I want to teach you. What you already have is valuable. Valuable? What's valuable? 
The only thing I value is here, coming here once a week. But don't you see, if you're going to write this sort of thing, to pass examinations, you're going to have to suppress, perhaps even abandon your uniqueness. I'm going to have to change you. But don't you realise? I want to change. Listen, is this your way of telling me that I can't do it, that I'm no good? It's not that at all. If that's what you're trying to tell me, I'll no, go No, 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 no. Of course you're good enough. See, I know it's difficult for you with someone like me, but you've just got to keep telling me and then I'll start to take it in. You see, with me, you've got to be dead firm. You won't hurt me feelings, you know, if, if I do something that's crap. I don't want pity. Just tell me it's crap. Here, it's crap. Right? So we dump that in the bin and we start again. Vision, return from the city. Welcome back. Welcome. Frank, it was fantastic. <laughs> Honest, it was you, just... you mean summer school itself or London? Or... All of it. This crowd of us stuck together all week. Dead late every night, staying up talking, went all around London, got drunk, went to the theatres, bought all sorts of second-hand gear in the market. Look, do you like it, do you? You look fabulous. What about work? Did you have any time for actual work? Work? We never stopped. Lashing us with it, they were. Another essay. Smack. Do it again. Lash. And this is the same woman who was terrified at the prospect of going to summer school. Oh, Frank, at first I was. I was going to come home. Everyone else looked so clever and cool. But the first afternoon, I was standing in the library, you know, looking at the books, pretending I knew what I was doing. Anyway, this tutor come up to me, saw the book I was clutching and said, Oh, are you fond of failing Getty? Well, it was right on the tip of my tongue to say, only when I save a parmesan cheese, but Frank, <laughs> I didn't. And I heard myself saying, actually, I'm not too familiar with the American poets. <laughs> Frank, you would have been dead proud of me. We sat around for ages talking about the beat poets, and I forgot all about my nerves after that. Even in the main lecture hall. There must have been about 2,000 of us, Frank, but when it was time for questions, I stood up. Honest to God. Everyone's looking at me, but I did it. I asked the question. <laughs> and? And what? And what was the question? Oh, I don't know. I forget now, because after that I was asking questions all week. You couldn't keep me down. I think that first question was about Chekhov, because, you know, I'm dead familiar with Chekhov now. <laughs> oh, wait, what was France like? I've asked you about it. Go on. Well, there isn't a lot to tell. Oh, go on. I've never been to France. Tell me what it was like. Well, it was rather hot. Oh, and I brought you something back. I uh, stopped at duty free and I thought... Siggies! Frank, I've packed up. Have you? Yeah. Aren't you proud of me? Uh, yeah. Yes, of course, yeah. Did you do any writing while you were away? Uh, little. Oh, will you let me read it? Well, one day perhaps. Did you drink much while you were there? Um, a little. So, you wrote a bit, you drank a bit. Is that all you've got to tell me about France? Um, I think so. Oh, yeah, Julia left me. What? Yeah, we had this ridiculous row. Because of the drink? Strangely, no. It all started over a plate of Earth's en cocotte. What? Eggs, my dear. Eggs. You and Julia split up because of eggs? Well, let's say it began with eggs. Anyway, that's France. And now the holiday's over. You're back. Even Julia's back. Is she? Is she all right? Never better. I get the feeling that Julia and I have a wonderful future as long as I don't make the mistake of ever ordering Earth's a la Florentine. Eggs, Florentine. Trish loves eggs done like that. So, Earth's means eggs, does it? Trish. Trish, me flat, me Trish. God, is it that long since I've seen you, Frank? She moved into the flat with me just before I went to summer school. Oh, really? Haven't I told you about Trish? Frank, she's brilliant. she got taste, Frank, you know, like you. She's just got it. Everything in the flat's dead and pretentious. Just books and plants everywhere. I'm having the time of my life, you know, Frank. I even feel young again. 26, my dear, is hardly old. I know that, but, I mean, I feel young, like them out there. I can be young. Oh, listen. Frank, I got you a present. Oh. It isn't much, but I thought... 
Here. Ah. I know it's only a pen, but I got it engraved. Must only be used for poetry. <laughs> By strictest order, Rita. Uh, thought it might be like a gentle hint. Gentle. Every time you try and write a letter or a note with that pen, it won't work. You'll read the inscription and it'll make you feel dead guilty because you're not writing poetry. Thank you, Rita. It's a pleasure. Come on. What are we doing this time? Let's do a dead good poet. Come on, let's go and have the tutorial down there. Down where? Down there, on the grass. Come on. On the grass? Nobody sits out there at this time of year. They do. There's some out there now. Well, they'll have wet bums. Well, what's a wet bum? You can sit on a bench. Come on. Rita, I absolutely protest. Why? Like Dracula, I have an aversion to sunlight. <sighs> All right. Let's open a window. Well, if you must open a window, go on, open it. I won't be budge. I'm not surprised, my dear. It hasn't been open for generations. You need air in here, Frank. The room needs air in This room does not need air, thank you very much. Of course it does. A room is like a plant. Uh, uh, a room is like a plant? Yeah, it needs air. Uh, and water too, presumably. If, if you're going to make an analogy, why don't we take it the whole way? Let's get a watering can and water the carpet. Bring in two tonnes of soil and a bag of fertiliser. Maybe we could take cuttings and germinate other little rooms. Oh, go away, you're mental, you You said it distinctly. You said a room is like a plant. Well? <laughs> well, what? Well, any analogy will break down eventually. Yeah, and some will break down sooner than others. But look, a great poet. You wanted a great poet, and uh, I know the very one. Now, where is he? I was going to introduce you to him earlier. But uh, now, where the hell is he going? Uh, I thought you were cutting down on that stuff. Did I say I was? No, but I... But what? Frank, why do you have to do it when you've got so much going for you? It is indeed because I have so much going for me that I do it. Life is such a rich and frantic world that I need the drink to help me step delicately through it. It'll kill you, Frank. Rita, I thought you weren't interested in reforming me. I'm not. It's just... What? Just that. I thought you'd started reforming yourself. Under your influence? But, Rita, if I do repent and reform, what happens when your influence is no longer here? What do I do then when, in appalling sobriety, I watch you walk away and disappear, all influence gone forever? Who says I'm going to disappear? Oh, you will, Rita. You've got to. Why have I got to? Well, this course could go on for years. And when I've got through this one, I might even get into the proper university here. And we'll all live happily ever after. Your going is as inevitable as... as... Macbeth? <laughs> yeah, as tragedy, yeah. But it will not be a tragedy, because I will be glad to see you go. Oh, thank you. Will you really? Be glad to see you go. Well, I certainly don't want to see you stuck in a room like this for the rest of your life. Now, uh You can be a real misery sometimes, can't you? I was dead happy when I first came in here and then you start to make me feel like I'm having a bad night in a mortuary. Well, here's something to cheer you up. Here's our dead good poet. Look. Blake. William Blake. You will understand, Blake. They overcomplicate him, Rita, but you will understand. You will love the man. I know. What? Now, let me just find... Um... Oh, Rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. He, you know it? <laughs> yeah. We did him at summer school. Blake at summer school? You weren't supposed to do Blake at summer school, were you? Nah, but we had this lecturer there. He was a real Blake freak. Knew absolutely everything about him. He was dead infectious. So, so you've already done Blake? You've covered all the songs of innocence and experience? Frank, of course. You don't do Blake without doing innocence and experience, do you? No. No, of course. Come in. Hello, Frank. Hello, Rita, you're late. Yes, Frank, I'm aware of that and terribly sorry. It was unavoidable. Was, was it? What have you done with your voice? I have decided to talk properly 
As Trish says, there is not a lot of point in discussing beautiful literature in a hugly voice. You haven't got a hugly voice. At least you didn't have. Talk properly. I am talking properly. You mean you're going to talk like that for the rest of this tutorial? Trish says that no matter how difficult, I must persevere. Well, will you kindly tell Trish that I'm not giving a tutorial to a Dalek? I am not a Dalek. Rita, stop it. But, Frank, I have to persevere. Rita, just be yourself. I am being myself. I'm just having a laugh. What's that? What? Uh, that on your back. Oh, that must be grass. Grass? Yeah. Got here a bit early today. I started talking to some students on the lawn. You were talking to the students down there? <laughs> Don't sound so surprised. I can talk now, you know, Frank. Yeah, but you used to be quite wary of them, didn't you? The regular students. God knows why. The students, they don't half come up with some garbage. Really? I only got talking to them in the first place because as I was walking past, I heard one of them saying as a novel he preferred Lady Chatterley to Sons and Lovers. I thought, I can keep walking and ignore it, or I can put them straight. So I walked over and said, excuse me, but I couldn't help overhearing what you were spouting about Lawrence. Should have seen the faces on them, Frank. I said, trying to compare Chatterley with Sons and Lovers is like trying to compare sparkling wine with champagne. Next thing is, there's this heated discussion with me right in the middle of it. I thought you said the student claimed to prefer Chatterley as a novel. He did. So he wasn't claiming that it was actually superior? Not at first, but then he did. He walked right into it. And you finished him off. Did you read it? Frank, he was asking for it. He was an idiot. His argument just crumbled. It wasn't just me. Everyone else agreed with me. Did they? There was this really mad one with them. I've only been talking to them for five minutes and he's inviting me to go abroad with them all. They're all going down to France in the Christmas holidays, slumming it. You can't go. What? You can't go. You've got your exams. My exams are before Christmas. Y yeah, but you'll have your results to wait for. I couldn't go anyway. Why not? That's all right for them. They can just jump into a van and go away. I can't. No, I suppose... Um... Tiger, they call him. He's the mad one. His real name's Tyson, but they call him Tiger. Is there any point going on with this, Rita? Going on with what? This. Marking your essay. Helping you towards an examiner. Is there really any point if you're going to fall in love and set off for the south of France? What? Fall in love? W with who? Frank, I've just been talking to some students. Christ, I've heard of matchmaking, but this is ridiculous. All right, but please stop burbling on about Mr Tyson. I haven't been burbling on. What's it like, me essay? It wouldn't be out of place with these, Rita. With all the other essays of the ordinary students. Really? Really. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. I've got... I had a tutorial. Oh, yeah, well, I uh, got uh, distracted. Bastards. Sod them. Sod them, eh, Rita? Who? <laughs> yeah, you would have told them, wouldn't you? Tell who, Frank? Students. Students reported me. Me. Complained. And you know something, Rita, it was the best lecture I've ever given. Were you pissed? <laughs> pissed. <laughs> I was glorious. Fell off the rostrum twice. Will they sack you? The sack? God, no. That would involve making a decision. Pissed is all right. To be sacked, it would have to be some kind of sexual shenanigans. And not just with the students, either. That would only amount to a slight misdemeanour. For dismissal, it would have to be nothing less than buggering the bursa. <laughs> They did suggest a sabbatical for a year. Some affiliated hovel of a college in Australia. Frank, even if you don't care about yourself, what about your students, Frank? What about the students? Well, it's hardly fair on them if their lecturer's so pissed that he's fallen off the rostrum. I might have fallen off, my dear, but I went down talking and came up talking. Never missed a syllable. What have they got to complain about? Maybe they did it for your own good. Yeah, or maybe they did it because they're a crowd of mealy-mouthed pricks who wouldn't know a poet if you beat them about the head with one. Assonance. I said to them, assonance means getting the rhyme wrong. <laughs> they looked at me as though I'd pissed on words with tomb. 
<laughs> Look, Frank, I'll see you next week. Where are you going? You, we've got a tutorial. Frank, you're not in any fit state for a tutorial. We can talk about the Blake essay next no, week. No, 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 you must stay. Watch this. Sober. Sober. Come on. Come on, sit down, sit down. You can't go. I want to talk to you about this. Rita, what's this? Is there something wrong with it? It's just... Look, this passage about the blossom. You seem to interpret the poem as being unequivocally sexual. Yeah, because it is. Is it? Well, it's certainly like a richer poem, isn't it? If it's interpreted in that way. Richer? Why richer? We discussed this poem at some length, a literal, uncomplicated celebration of growth, of blossom itself. Yeah, in one sense. But it's like like the poem about the rose, isn't it? It becomes a more rewarding poem when you see that it works on a number of levels. Rita, the blossom is a simple, uncomplicated... Yeah, that's what you say, Frank. But Trish and me and some of the others were talking about Blake, and what uh. came out of our discussion was that apart from the simple surface value of Blake's poetry, there's always a, like, um... Um, well, go on. A, like, vein of, of concealed meaning. I mean, if that poem's only about blossom, then it's not much of a poem, is it? So, you think it gains from being interpreted in this way? Is my essay wrong, then, Frank? It's not, not wrong, but I don't like it. You're being subjective. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I suppose I am. If it was in an exam, what sort of mark would it get? A good one. Well, what the hell are you saying, then? What I'm saying is that it's up-to-the-minute, quite acceptable, trendy stuff about Blake, but there's nothing of you in there. Or maybe, Frank, you mean there's nothing of your views in there? Maybe. Maybe you're right. But when I first came to you, Frank, you didn't give me any views. You let me find my own. And your views I still value. But, Rita, these aren't your views. But you told me not to have a view. You told me to be objective, to consult recognised authorities. Well, that's what I've done. I've talked to other people, read other books, and after consulting a wide variety of opinion, I came up with those conclusions. Yeah. All right. <sighs> Look, Frank... I don't have to go along with your views on Blake, you know. I can't have a mind of my own, can't I? I sincerely hope so, my dear. And what's that supposed to mean? It, it means... It means be careful. What do you mean, be careful? Just cos I'm learning, just cos I can do it now and read what I want to read and understand without having to come running to you every five minutes, you start telling me to be careful. Because... Be, because I... Care for you, I want you to care for yourself. I. I care for you, Frank. But you've got to. to leave me alone a bit. I'm not an idiot now, Frank. I can. I can do things on my own more now. Just. don't. don't keep treating me as though I'm the same as when I first walked in here. I understand now, Frank. I know the difference between. Between Thomas Hardy and Rita Mae Brown. And you're still treating me as though I'm hung up on Ruby Fruit Jungle. Just... You understand, don't you, Frank? Entirely, my dear. I'm sorry, Frank. Not at all. I finally got around to reading it, you know, Ruby Fruit Jungle. You were right. It's rather excellent. <laughs> Go away, Frank. Of its type, it's quite interesting, but it's hardly excellence. Frank, I know, I'm late. I'm sorry, am I too late? We were talking, I didn't notice the time. Talking? Yeah. If I'll go in my favour, we were talking about Shakespeare. Yeah, I'm sure you were. Am I too late then? <sighs> All right, I'll be on time next week, I promise. Rita, don't go. No, honestly, Frank, I know I've wasted your time. I'll see you next week, eh? Rita, sit down. When you were so late, I phoned the salon. The what? The hairdressing salon where you work, or I should say worked. I haven't worked there for a long time. I work in a bistro now. You didn't tell me. Didn't I? I was telling someone. 
But, but it wasn't me. Oh, sorry. It did strike me that there was a time when you told me everything. I thought I had told you. No. Do you like a drink? Who cares if I've left hairdressing to work in a bistro? I care. You don't want a drink, mind if I do? But why do you care about details like that? It's just boring, insignificant detail. Oh, is it? That's why I couldn't stand being in a hairdresser's any longer. Boring, irrelevant detail all the time, on and on. Well, I'm sorry, but I've had enough of that. I don't want to talk about rubbish anymore. And what do you talk about in your bistro? Cheers. Everything. Everything? Yeah. Ah. We talk about what's important, Frank, and we leave out the boring details for those who want them. Is Mr Tyson one of your customers? A lot of students come in. He's one of them. You're not going to give me another warning, are you, Frank? Would it do any good? Look, for your information, I do find Tiger fascinating. Like I find a lot of the people I mix with fascinating. They're young and they're passionate about things that matter. Well, then perhaps perhaps you don't want to waste your time coming here anymore. Oh, don't be stupid. I'm sorry I was late. Look, Frank, I've got to go. I'm meeting Trish at seven. We're going to see a production of The Seagull. No, oh, yeah, well, when Chekhov calls. Oh, for God's sake. You can hardly bear to spend a moment here, can you? That isn't true. It's just that I've got to go to the theatre. And last week, you didn't turn up at all. Just a phone call to say that you had to cancel. It's just that, that there's so many things happening now. It's harder. As I said, Rita, if you want to stop coming... Oh, for Christ's sake, I don't want to stop coming here. I've got to come here. What about my exam? Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. You'll sail through it anyway. You really don't have to put in the odd appearance out of sentimentality. I'd rather you spared me that. If you could stop pouring that junk down your throat in the hope that it'll make you feel like a poet, you might be able to talk about things that matter instead of where I do or do not work, and then it might be worth coming here. Are you capable of recognising what does or does not matter, Rita? I understand literary criticism, Frank. When I come here, that's what we're supposed to be dealing you with. You want literary criticism? Give me an essay on that by next week. And what is it? No sentimentality, no subjectivity, just pure literary criticism. A considered assessment of a lesser-known English poet. Me. Pass down on what you give people when you entertain. I mean, do you think people basically are going? Hello. Into what the hell are you doing here? I'm not seeing you till next week. Are you sober? Are oh, yeah. If you mean, am I still this side of reasonable comprehension? Then yes. Because I want you to hear this when you are sober, Frank. These are brilliant. You've seriously got to start writing again. This stuff is witty, profound, full of style. Really? Frankie, they are brilliant. And that's not just my opinion. Me and Trish sat up last night reading every single one of them and Trish agrees this is real poetry. Why did you stop writing when you can produce work like this? Me and Trish just couldn't stop talking about it. She says, what makes it more like, more, oh, what did she say, more resonant than most contemporary poetry is that you can see in it a direct line through to 19th century traditions of, of like wit and classical illusion. Wow, isn't that just marvelous, Rita? And how fortunate for me that I didn't let you see it sooner. Imagine if I'd let you read this stuff when you first came here. I know, Frank. I wouldn't have understood it then. You, you would have thrown it across the room and dismissed it as garbage, <laughs> wouldn't you? I know. Because back then, Frank, the illusions would have just been lost on someone like me. Oh, I've done a fine job on you, haven't I? It's true, Frank. I can appreciate and understand that kind of work now. Do you know, Rita, I think, like you, I might change my name, insist on being known as Mary, Mary Shelley. Do you appreciate and understand that illusion, Rita? What? She wrote a little gothic number called Frankenstein. So? So this facile, vacuous wad of self-conscious illusion and allegory is worthless, talentless shit and could be recognised as such by anyone with a shred of common sense is the sort of thing that gives poetry a bad name. Wit. You'll find more wit in the telephone book and probably more insight, although it does have one advantage over the telephone directory. It's easier to rip. 
It is pure art, pretentious and totally lacking in style. I don't agree. Oh, I don't expect you to, Rita. After all, you recognise the hallmark of literature now, don't you? Why don't you just go away? I don't think I can bear it any longer. Oh, can't bear what, Frank? You! My dear, you! No. What you can't bear, Mr. self pity and piss artist, is that I am educated now. What's up, Frank? Or don't you like it now that the little girl's grown up? Now that you can no longer watch me stare back in wide-eyed wonder at everything you say? I'm educated. I've got what you have and you don't like it because you'd rather see me as the peasant I once was. You're like the rest of them. You like to keep your native stick because that way they still look charming and delightful. I don't need you. I know what clothes to wear, what wine to buy, what plays to see, what papers and books to read. I can do without you. Is that all you wanted? Did, did you come all this way for so very, very little? Oh, it's little to you, isn't it? Little to you who squanders every opportunity, who mocks and takes it for granted. You found a culture, have you, Rita? You found a better song to sing? No, you, you, you found a different song, that's all. And on your lips, it's shrill and hollow and tuneless. Oh, Rita. 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 Nobody calls me Rita but you. I dropped that pretentious crap as soon as I saw it for what it was. You stupid... Nobody calls me Rita. What, what is it now? Virginia? Or... Or, or Charlotte? Or, or Jane? Or Emily? Or, or Virginia? Yeah, um, I think she works there. Rita White. No, no, sorry, no. Uh, what was it? Um, Susan White. No. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Hello, yeah, uh, 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 um, Tr Trish, is it? Uh, yeah, I'm a, f I'm a friend of Rita's. I'm, I'm sorry, Susan's. Yeah. Uh, could, could you just say, uh, uh, it's Frank, here. Yeah, yeah, her, her tutor. Yeah. Um, well, I I yeah. Could you just tell her that I've entered her for the examination? Yeah. You see, she doesn't know the details, you know, the time and the, where the exam's being held. And could you, could you tell her to, could you tell her to call in? Yeah, please. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Frank. Hello. I bought you a Christmas card. Thanks. What are you doing? Why are you packing your books away? Um, off on a trip. Australia. Some weeks ago, made rather a night of it. Did you book at the bear, sir? <sighs> Metaphorically. As it was metaphorical, the sentence was commuted. Instead of the sack, they gave me two years in Oz. Hardly a reduced sentence, really, but... What did Julia say? Uh, bon voyage. She's not going with you? No. 
Here, let me give you a hand. Pass them down to me. Uh, thanks. So what are you going to do? Well, what do you think I'll do? Oz? It's a paradise for the likes of me. Come on, Frank. I'm serious. Didn't you know the Aussies named their favourite drink after a literary figure? Forster's Lager, they call it. Of course, they get the spelling wrong, rather like you once did. Be serious. For God's sake, why did you come back here? I came to thank you. To tell you what a good teacher you are. And to thank you for entering me for the exam. Well, that's all right. I know how much it had come to mean to you. You didn't even want me to sit the exam, did you? I thought about it, you know. I thought about just writing, Frank knows all the answers, cross me paper and then leaving. But I didn't. And you know, when I looked at the paper, you'll never guess the first question, Frank. Mm -hmm. Suggest ways in which one might cope with some of the staging difficulties in a production of Peer Ging. <laughs> well, you certainly should have had no trouble with that. I did, though. I just sat looking at the paper and thinking about everything you'd said. I've been trying to ignore it, telling myself that you were wrong. And in some ways you were. You think I ended up with nothing, just a load of quotes and empty phrases. And I did, but that wasn't your doing. I was so hungry. I wanted it all so much that I didn't want it to be questioned. I told you right from the beginning, Frank, that I was stupid. It's like Trish, you know, me flatmate. Me thinking she was so cool and sophisticated and together. I came home the other night and she tried to top herself. What's all that about? She spends half her life eating whole foods and health foods to make her live longer and the other half trying to kill herself. I was thinking about all that as I sat there in the exam, looking at that question about Peer Gint. And then I picked up my pen and started writing. And you wrote, do it on the radio? <laughs> I could have done. But I chose not to. I had a choice, Frank. I did the exam. I know. A good pass as well. Yeah. And it might all be worthless in the end, but I had a choice, Frank. Because of you, I had a choice. And I wanted to come back and tell you that. You know, um, I hear very good reports of Australia. Stuff's starting to happen there. The thing is, why don't you come as well. It, it might be a good move leaving a place that seems to be finishing for one that's just beginning. Isn't that called jumping a sinking ship? So what? Do you really think there's any chance of us keeping it afloat? Hey Frank, if you could get tuppens back on each of those bottles you could buy Australia. You're being evasive. I know. Tiger's asked me to go down to France for this mob. Will you? I don't know. He's a bit of a wanker, really. But I've never been to France. And my mother's invited me to Ayers for Christmas. What are you going to do? I don't know. I might go to France. I might go to my mother's. I might decide to have a baby. I might even come out to Australia one day. I don't know what I'll do. But whatever it is, it'll be my choice. Well, whatever you do, you might as well take this one. <laughs> what is it? It's, um, well, it's, um, it's a dress, really. I bought it some time ago for, uh, for an educated woman <laughs> friend of mine. I don't know if it, um, exactly fits. I was rather pissed when I bought it. An educated woman, Frank. And is that what you call a scholarly neckline? When choosing it, I put rather more emphasis on the word woman than on the word educated. All I've ever done is take from you. I've never given anything. That's not true. It is true. I never thought there was anything I could give you. But there is. Come here, Frank. What? Come here. Ah? Huh? Sit down here. Uh -uh. Sit. I'm going to take ten years off you. Uh, uh. Now, pass me those scissors. 